do it, but shit. Oh my god. Okay, back on to something that is more available, and that is another observation. Now, something that's pertinent about a radar report is I could get it delivered to me in many different ways. The way that I have it delivered here is not very likely, but I could get a, a radar report in many different ways. That is observed weather. That radar report is never a forecasted weather. That is observed weather. This is also observed weather. There was a pilot somewhere that observed this phenomena and reported it. The PIREP report form is here. These five blocks are mandatory. So if I want to issue a pilot report, which I do quite often, just to let other aviators in my area know what's going on exactly from a, a Cessna 172 point of view, or what's going on exactly from a, uh, from a King Air point of view, okay? Those five are required. So over, in other words, where am I at? What's the time? What's the flight level? What's the aircraft type? And how do I start each and every single different communication that I make? Who am I calling? And who am I? You're going to do that right from the very beginning. Okay? All right. So this is an upper air report or a UA. If there was anything urgent in nature about this upper air report, it would be listed as a UUA. I think these are fun sometimes because uh, about once every other month I'll see a, a Cessna 172 report severe turbulence. Okay, we'll see the turbulence reporting criteria pretty soon and see if that might be the case. But this one's over Oklahoma. Uh, six day, 13 or 30, 15. No, that's not right at all. What do I got here? Oh, uh, 063 radial on the uh, 15 miles from Oklahoma City. Where's Oklahoma City? Right there, Will Rogers. Where's that VOR? Looks like it's here. This pilot is 063, somewhere off 063, 15 miles away. The time is 1522. They're at 8,000 feet. It's a 172, a Cessna 172. Temperature of the air is minus four. Wind velocity, 245 at 40. Turbulence light from 5,500 to 7,500. And they got remarks in the clear. So they have no clouds or no obstructions to visibility there. All right, any questions on PIREPs? Yep. And then we have this actual aviation flight controller or ATC. ATC does not get involved. Mm. Damn. ATC is not going to take the, one of these reports if I call them up and say I have a standard PI rep. Okay. Flight service station does that. But if I want to give the information to ATC as something that I experienced in a time sensitive uh, nature. So in other words, during landing, I experience wind shear of 20 knots. I can pass that to ATC after I get on the ground and, and they'll process the pilot report. But ATC is not in the business of processing pilot reports. If you tell them that there's something and it's safety in nature, safety related, they will 100% work that and pass it on to flight service station. But you're right, this is done on the radio. Yeah. Just call the flight service station on the radio and tell them your pilot report.
have these classes in Sky Eagle Aviation Academy, check out please our website www.atp.academy for details. Okay, here's another one. Uh, upper air report, so not urgent. Over Oklahoma City to Tulsa, time 1800, flight level 120. Uh, it's a King Air 90, an E90 or a C90, something like that, maybe an F90. Sky condition, broken 1800 tops 55. Overcast, 7200 tops 89, clear above. Temperature of the air is minus seven. Wind velocity, 080 at 21. Turbulence is light from while I was in the broken layer. And turbulence, were, icing was light to moderate rhyme when I was in the overcast layer, okay? Where's the ceiling here? What, where is it though? Thousand eight hundred. Do I have minimum VFR based on just what I see up here? I don't have any visibility reports, but do I have minimum VFR based on the information I have here? Yeah, it's over a thousand, so I got minimum VFR. All right, but these guys definitely didn't stay VFR. Uh, they, they were in a cloud, they were out the top of one, and then they entered another cloud and came out the top of that one and it's clear above. Okay, pilot reports are pretty useful. I usually, until you get that Cessna that was experiencing extreme turbulence, I was like, are you kidding me? How is this possible? That means the airplane fell apart, by the way. So, but you get one like once every other month. I can just imagine the person that's flying this airplane. I just want to see their face. Yes. No, so, I, okay, so remember, it's reported or observed somehow, processed, and then disseminated. So during that observation phase, while the pilot is uh, issuing the report to flight service station, it's not likely that you're gonna hear that at all, because you're not gonna fly along and monitor flight service station. You, you know, you, you're just not gonna do that. So where do I get the information? Couple of different places. <laughs> I can get information while I'm on the ground in the pre-flight phase during my weather brief. In route, I can get the information by calling flight service station and saying, hey, do y'all have any updated weather information for me? And certainly I could, and they have notes of when the last time I called for a weather uh, brief was, and then I tell them my position, they know where I am, and then I could get information, to, so they're not gonna ask me and start all over from fresh, like they've never heard from me before. But yeah, I could get that from flight service station. Something else is kind of cool, is if your airplane is equipped with FIS B and you have that ADSBN, you could get these reports right there on your flight deck. And it'll show you exactly what you have right there. Okay? And now why would I report any of that information? Should there be the abbreviation or abbreviation or No. When you're when you're issuing the report, you just give it to them in plain English. Okay. And I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd because I do these quite a bit. So I'll, I'll tell them, you know, block two, I am not. Block uh, three is times this, block four. Because I know the person that's on the other end of these, it, it, it's nice if it's convenient for them to write it down. They have a form like this, they probably just have a yellow pad and they're writing this thing down. And once they get off the radio with me, then they gotta process it in the computer. But you could call them and say, hey, this is Cessna 172, 1456. And I'm near the Pahokee VOR at 3,000 feet. I want to issue a pilot report. Well, you didn't tell them the time. You know, they need to know the time, but the assumption could be that it was right now. And then you could continue on and say, hey, the sky's clear up here. I don't have any icing and no rain. And it looks like I got an a overcast layer above me about 4,000 feet above where I am. Just tell it to them. Yep. But in plain English, no, mm -hmm. there's no chance I get this information with this abbreviation, right? Not, not on a computer, not on a radio. No, no, you're, you, no one is going to hear this. When I say no one. I, I mean, uh, I don't see it on any screen in the way it is shown, right? This is the only way that you're going to get it.
Yes. Yes. And you'll never hear that. You'll never hear that report. Because you do not monitor that frequency. The frequency that they issue this report on is not a frequency that you're going to monitor. You're, you're not going to be on the same frequency that they are when they're given the report. There's hundreds of frequencies available. And the frequency that you listen to and monitor is not this one. The only time you go to this frequency is if you want to talk to flight service station. And when you want to talk to flight service station now, you're going to issue a report and you're going to get off that frequency. Can you monitor uh, two or more frequencies simultaneously? You can, but in the beginning that's not a good idea. Because it, it, it's just, it's a little bit overloading. Are you okay with that? I, I feel like you don't believe me. <laughs> I feel like you, you think I'm telling you a story. So uh, you are not obligated to do this by yourself. So You're not obligated to do it. So, yeah, so if you see that the weather is bad or changing, so you, don't have to you don't have to say anything to anybody. I don't have to give this report at all. A lot of pilots just don't, but some pilots do. And in fact, flying VFR, if I'm not in, if I am not in Bravo, Charlie, Delta airspace, I can't fly VFR in class alpha, so I didn't say that one. But if I'm not Bravo, Charlie, Delta airspace, most of the time, I've got the, I've got the radio turned off. I just don't want to listen to anybody. And I'm 100% listening to Van Halen. <laughs> okay? I'm not listening to not one person at all. Especially not somebody out there, I got extreme turbulence over here in my Cessna. No, you don't. No, you don't. Okay? All right. Here we go. Terminal aerodrome forecast. What did I say about the TAF? Five statute miles. Yeah. It's 24 hours. Could be up to 30 hour report. Depending on the... It's not at every airport. These are forecasts. We've now gone from observations. So we've went from METARs, which are going to happen at a lot of airports. You know, kind of through radars. Because we're going to see graphic reports for radars. Keeping it pertinent. And uh, through PIREPS, right? And then now we're on the side of forecasts. From what we're going to talk about for the next couple of minutes is all forecasts. Concise statement of expected meteorological conditions significant aviation for a specified period within five statute miles of the center of the airport's runway complex, what's called the terminal. The TAFs use the same weather codes found in METAR, pretty much. It can be viewed on the National Weather Service, NWS, Aviation Digital Data Service website at, because these are the people that wrote the book, and these are the people that make these reports. But this is not Flight Service Station, and if I get my weather off of this site, there's no record of me ever having a weather report. Okay? Again, 1-800-WSBrief.com. Okay, that's your TAF. Here are some examples of TAFs. Memphis, Oklahoma City. Now, this looks terribly daunting. It looks like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? I encourage you to download the TAFs and begin to read these things on a routine basis, especially if you're a few weeks away from coming to Fort Lauderdale and training. Begin to read these, you know. What you're doing by doing that is helping yourself begin that journey towards becoming pilot in command. As you get to your flight instructor, guess what? You've got that person for two, maybe three hours, and then they're on to somebody else. They probably had someone else before you. If they spend 45 minutes teaching you about a task, the, the flight might not happen. That's not the end of the world, okay? 
I'd much rather teach you something that I need to teach you before we take off, and especially if it's a point where you need to know this information because you're soon going to be pilot in command. But if you miss that flight, well, it starts kicking the, the time frame, you know, a little further down the road, okay? All right, so on the 12th day at 1700 Zulu, the following report was issued valid for the 12th day at 1800 until the next day at 1800. So the report was issued here. It's valid at these times. 200, 12 knots, fine, five statute miles, haze. I got a ceiling, broken ceiling at 3,000. 40% probability between these hours, 20 to 2,200, that I have a reduction of visibility, one statute mile, thunderstorms and rain, overcast at eight cumulonimbus. So there's your TS and your CB. Those will always happen the same in the TAF, okay? So the very first statement just says, what's going to happen at Memphis beginning at 1800? Then after that, it goes to from this time, from that exact time right there, this will occur. From that time, this will occur. It will become from 1,000 to 1,200, so there's like a two-hour time span there that these conditions will begin to become calm, three statute miles, mist, sky clear, temporarily from 12 to 14, half statute mile of fog. These are the exact reports that IFR pilots use to define when they need to file for an alternate or not. So these have some, some real legal binding uh, mechanisms to them. These, these actually hold pilots to the fire on how much fuel they need to take on this trip. If that shows that I have only one half statute miles visibility, I might need to file an alternate. If my close, and I know Memphis is, it's in Tennessee, it's kind of close to a lot of other airports. Well, they almost all are. But if I'm in Tennessee and my nearest suitable alternate is two hours away or an hour away, if my arrival time is here, I got to take fuel now to go to that alternate and then to 45 more minutes. So this could really cause me some problems, this report, based on the information that's in it. That's why I'm telling you, when, when they consider this report valid and accurate, it 100% is. And it's updated four times daily. So every six hours, it's going to come out a new TAF, and they'll update and continuous to, continuously improve the product. All right? So Oklahoma City, same type of thing. On the fifth day at 1100 Zulu, I have the following report that's valid from the fifth day at 12 to 1200 the next day. 140 at eight knots, five statute miles, missed. Broken ceiling, right? Broken at 3000. Temporarily from 1300 to 1600, one and a half statute miles and missed. Let me give you a, an easy, easy, easy memory aid for the TAFs and any kind of times associated with them. If it seems like the time is listed as an exact minute, it's not an exact minute. It's a range of two different hours. You follow me? These forecasters are good, but there's no way in hell that they're going to say at 1316 exactly that you're gonna have one and a half statute miles of visibility, okay? So somewhere between 1300 and 1600, that's a little more realistic, all right? And the same type of thing going across. Now, I don't know why they did it. You see this little equal sign here? I probably bashed my face into desks for the first three or four years teaching because I couldn't find out what that thing means. And come to find out, it means nothing. Something that you'll find in a TAF that you will not find in a METAR is a visibility listed as anything more than six. 
Okay, you won't find anything more than six in a TAF. You'll only find more than six statute miles visibility. P6SM. What that indicates is that that is severe clear. Okay? You will not have any problems flying with more than six mi uh, statute mile visibility. Okay? All right. Here we go. Everybody put on your seat belts. Okay? All right, I heard some seat belts clicking. Winds aloft forecast. It starts getting funny right off the bat because the winds aloft forecast is called an FD. I, it, there's probably a reason why. I just, after the equal sign thing, I couldn't look at that book anymore for a while. Okay? But each one of these correspond to different altitudes. Across the top of this report, it has a note for me, a little love note up here that says, all the temperatures are negative above 24,000 feet. So happy to have the, the love note, that's fine. Here's my, my valid data on the, 15th of the, on the 15th of the month at 1800 Zulu, and I'm gonna use it from 1700 to 12, or 2100. That tells me the second line that the, is based on observations at 12, valid to 1800. Okay? And then the 15th, it's intended to use from 17 to 21 Zulu on the same day. And each one of these columns will describe the winds in true direction. When we start doing flight computers, it's very important you understand these winds and these forecasts are true direction. So winds in true directions with magnitude of however many knots and a temperature that's forecasted to exist somewhere between 17 to 2100 Zulu. Well, 3000 feet doesn't exist. Why? It's Denver. There's a rock there. And 6000 feet doesn't exist. There's a rock there too. The very first, you guys understand, the big old mountain, okay. So the very first one that I get is at 6,000 feet, wind 270 at 14, and I don't get any temperature at all. Oh, that's because it's very close to the field elevation. It's just the field elevation temperature. Here at HLC, I know that this field is a little bit lower because I actually get a temperature here. So that one's probably 4,000 feet. 3,500 feet, okay? And it's minus one degree Celsius. ALA 24020, no temperature, means the field elevation is very high, close to 9,000 feet. And then as we go along, I continue to read all these with negative numbers until after 24,000 and everything beyond 24,000 is negative. So they don't put it there. Okay, remember when I said that I was, at, or remember when I asked about my Fortran coders? So Fortran had only a certain amount of, of digits that you could use in it. Back when you could use punch cards and you're programming with punch cards, this is a long time ago. But they only, they, FAA, the NOAA that's putting this thing together, they only allowed six digits with a plus or minus modifier or just only a minus modifier, plus or minus modifier less than 24,000. But they only allowed six digits to describe wind and temperature. If the wind went more than 99 knots, it had to be coded in such a way so that they still only used six digits. All right, everybody following along a little bit with that? All right, here we go. Wind, well, of course, we talked about this, 3,000 feet. The wind forecasts are not issued within 1,500 feet of a location's elevation, so I don't get anything there. Temperature forecasts not issued for altitudes within 25 feet of it. Okay, that's fine. Forecasts are intended, right, uh, determined by interpolation. So if I want to get the temperature, or correction, if I want to get the winds, between 
12,000 and 18,000, I have to figure out by interpolation what the two of those are, okay? But let's take a look all the way down here. This looks like St. Louis. Is there such a direction as 730? I like your answer. The answer is no. Okay. I could turn around 760 degrees, but I'm just making a bunch of circles, and it looks crazy. So there is no real 7th. It's either going to be somewhere with 0 to 359. So 730 tells me that whoever generated this report is trying to send me a message. The message is the wind speed is 100 knots or more. So what I have to do is I have to subtract 5-0 from the wind direction. The wind direction is 7-3. Subtract 5-0. What do I get? Okay, 2-3. So 230 degrees true. And I know that my wind is more than 100, so look, my wind is 106. Right? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You'd think they would just put another digit in there, but I think if they did, it would confuse people, especially by this time. So what about this next one? Seven three. Is that a real? Is that a real direction? No. What do I do with it? Subtract five zero. I get two three. So my wind direction is two thirty. What's the wind speed? One nineteen. Okay. It's definitely not nineteen up here. I mean, look. It went from thirty nine, fifty six, seventy three, ninety four to six. No. 106, 119, okay. All right. Fantastic question. Number one, if there was ever a 219 or a 319, we would probably be witnessing the end times, okay? It's <laughs> doomsday scenario, okay? So let's hope not. Number two, the report is only valid to 199. So there's no such thing as a reported 200 knot wind. It could be over 200. It could be 210, 220, right? But anything greater than that, and what are we talking? You're talking 10% difference is not gonna you know, make the end of the earth. <clears throat> 199 is exactly more than enough, which we're starting to get into the idea of how to do FAA performance calculations. It's about, yes, right. They got as accurate as we can get. Okay, that whole thing that I just went with you guys for the 730 and all that. The, uh, temperature. Last two digits are temperature. That's still, yeah, minus 49, minus 60. Okay. So... I have had instances where I get a class that's literally by this. You guys are, I tell you, I'm in every, every uh, February 16th, I'm going to send all of you like thank you cards for the next however many years because it's been great. But I've had classes before where we get to this point and it's all like, no, we're not dealing with you anymore. And so I just do this and then I walk out and I get a coffee. Because what I just now got done telling you about the 50 and the 100 knots and all that, it's right there. You could read it if you want, if that helps you. But yeah, sometimes that gets to be a little bit of a trick. Okay, air mets. We're down at the bottom of the list. You guys remember we were over at air mets and sig mets. It was all the way almost at the bottom. So this is fantastic. What did I say air mets and sig mets were? What are these things? You remember? Okay, nice. These are some sort of some sort of weather hazard over at least 3,000 square feet. Okay, so this is a large geographical area, and it has some sort of hazard. 
100% correct. The air mats are moderate, and I can see this. Air mat, I got uh, moderate, 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 a bunch of moderate in there. You'll see when we get to sigma, I got a whole bunch of, uh, of severe, okay? But that air mat is gonna describe where do I have the moderate conditions? What's gonna affect me flying? It might not, might not force me to not take the flight, but maybe I need to really prepare and consider my personal minimums. Maybe I need to really think about how long it's been since I've flown and what kind of airplane I'm flying in, what the capabilities are there. So look, here, air mats, and we'll go into the different air mats. You got Sierra Tango and Zulu. They're coded to let me know what kind of air mat I'm talking about, whether it's visibility or turbulence or icing. So those are the real hazards, visibility, turbulence, and icing. Uh, an air mat Sierra means ceiling less than 1,000 feet, visibility less than three. There's my basic VFR. Three statute miles, 1,000 feet. If I don't have that, air mat Sierra, okay? Or widespread mountain obscurations. Widespread mountain ob obscurations are exactly this. Imagine a mountain range for a moment, okay? It, it goes up and down peaks and valleys. I could have a ceiling of this entire area that's at 4,000 feet, but part of these mountains are obscured by that ceiling. So this is a hazard. If I don't have TOS or terrain warning uh, systems on my, on my airplane, it, it could result, depending on the visibility, and has in the past, resulted in a phenomenon called C-fit. What's it mean? Somebody's heard of it. Controlled flight into terrain. I'm flying this airplane, maybe, I'm, maybe it's dark and I just don't see the mountain. Maybe it's in a cloud. I didn't see the cloud and I don't remember getting into a cloud and all of a sudden, big boom and a lot of light, okay? So that's widespread mountain obscuration. Moderate turbulence. I love turbulence reporting criteria. I know you guys are gonna be awesome on re reporting turbulence. Uh, sustained surface winds greater than 30 knots. That's an air mat. Look, if the winds are 30 knots or greater, do ground. Do the flight simulator. Study for your written. Go eat a lunch. Do something else. Don't try to fly this dumb airplane, okay? It's not worth it. Sustained surface wind more than 30 knots. Now, getting into uh, icing, this is my AirMet Zulu. So AirMet Sierra, my apologies, but for turbulence is AirMet Tango and AirMet Zulu. We get back over to these. We, we go through these again. But AirMet Zulu is moderate icing. Top and bottom of moderate ice are specified. The range of, areas of, range of freezing, lowest freezing levels. We're flying in Florida. I get it. Let me tell you right now that all through the year in Florida, I collect ice. Okay, I'm probably in the flight levels. I'm getting it at 17, 18, 19, 20,000 feet. But that's all through the year. That's in the middle of the summer when the temperatures on the ground are 88, 90 degrees. So you come there in February, March, all right, the temperature is, it's, it's kind of chilly, it's nice and cold. I'm wearing my jacket because it's 50 degrees outside, okay, Fahrenheit. And if you climb just a couple thousand feet now, you could have icing. So moderate icing could be at a freezing level where you would fly. Okay, but I'm not going to fly through any, any icing as a VFR pilot because as a VFR pilot, I have no reason to be in a cloud. Remember, for icing, I needed to have freezing temperature and visible moisture. I'm never going to be in a cloud as a VFR pilot. Okay, a non-convective low-level wind shear, potential below 2,000 feet. Low-level wind shear, kind of what we talked about yesterday with a microburst, with a wind shear, winds changing in direction or speed rapidly, but a microburst is a super, super crazy, ridiculous, severe instance of low level wind shear, okay? Here they are, Sierra Tango Zulu. It would help me if I know these. So if I hear AirMet Sierra and it's in my area, I know that means IFR. If I hear AirMet Tango, I know for a fact there's turbulent conditions. Doesn't mean for me to cancel my flight, 
but I, I might have some turbulence, moderate turbulence. And Airmet Zulu describes icing. Here's the issuance criteria. Not to get crazy about it, but it's issued four times daily. All right, so every six hours, this is a normal routine report. If there's not an Airmet, it'll say none. Airmet Sierra, none. Airmet Tango, none. Airmet Zulu, none. So it's never ambiguous. You will never think, well, is there not one? They didn't put one on here, but is there maybe one? No. It'll either be, yes, these are the criteria, this is what's happening, or none. Okay? All right. For the love of me, I can't remember what's going on there, but I think that's a dust storm. Looking at my screen, this looks like a dust storm, or it could be volcanic ash. It's one or the other, but this is an air med. Right? And what, look at the area in which this exists. Widespread. Right? This is all across the uh, aperture of this camera taken from space. Hurricanes. Now we're getting into some national hurricane center and some convective segment or actual hurricane watches and warnings. This is not an air mat. Yes, it's a large area, probably way larger than 3,000 feet. This is not an air mat. This is not a sig mat. This is something much, much, much worse than any of that and includes its own reporting, okay? Whereas the widespread dust storms and sandstorms have reporting under air mat and sig mat criteria, the hurricanes have their own reporting. Okay, sig mats. Here's the issuance criteria for a sig mat. They are not a standard report. They are not issued on a schedule. They are issued whenever any of the following conditions are expected to affect at least 3,000 square miles. And that is severe or greater turbulence, severe icing, widespread dust storm, widespread sandstorm, volcanic ash. This volcanic ash, this whole idea here is the volcanic ash. That's definitely a sigma. And if it occurs and is affecting that region, then it will be issued. If there are no sigmets, then nothing is issued. Okay. Sigmets, non-convective issuance time and valid period. It's unscheduled product. Valid for no more than four hours. And if it is expected to continue beyond four hours, it's republished for an additional time period. Again, not to exceed four hours. Convective sigmet, convection, what's convection mean? Lifting from below. Exactly, hot to cold and then advection brings it back in, but convection is typically gonna bring things up, lift things. Lift things like lifting moisture into unstable conditions to form thunderstorms, all right? This is a routine issuance. It's issued every hour and valid for no more than two hour period. It's issued for a line of thunderstorms 60 miles long, affecting at least 40% of the length. An area of thunderstorms at least 3,000 square miles covering at least 40% of the area. Embedded or severe thunderstorms expected to occur more than 30 minutes. Which one was embedded? The one that's hidden? So I could have clouds all the way around this thing. I don't see the thunderstorm. There's one in there, but I can't see it. Convective sigma for special issuance criteria. If any a special convective sigma is issued when any of this stuff occurs, tornado. Hail greater than three quarter inch at the surface. Wind gust greater than 50 knots at the surface. Indication of rapidly changing conditions. They're not sufficiently described in convective sigma and special issuance is not is not required for a valid convective sigma. So sigma is severe or greater turbulence, uh, icing, volcanic ash, any, anything to do with thunderstorms is a convective sigma. And if there are no thunderstorms expected in that forecast period, then 
and it will say no convective sigmets. So airmets are scheduled, convective sigmets are scheduled, sigmets are not scheduled. Okay? All right. These are just terms that we use to describe the weather forecasts. And we kind of get comfortable describing those and, and, and learning them. Where do I find information out about this? While well, I'm perusing through my uh, reports online and I want to see how do I understand all about this? Where do I find that information? Advisory circular 00-45. Make sure you get the current edition. All the other ones will be canceled on the FAA.gov website. So if you get it off FAA.gov, if it is on there, that is the current one. The other ones will be canceled. Okay, convective sigma, issuance time. I told you it was it is scheduled. It is scheduled, uh, scheduled basis hourly. And can be valid for no more than two hours. If the conditions are expected to continue beyond two hours, a new convective sigma is then issued for a period of no more than two hours. Okay. Convective outlooks. Do the conditions exist to meet the criteria for thunderstorm development? On the day where we are now, they will issue five of those reports for the, for the following valid periods. So at six o'clock in the morning, UTC, right? right around midnight for us, they're going to issue a report that's valid from the very first part of that morning, seven or eight o'clock in the morning for the next four hours. The report just shows that, yes, you have the three thunderstorm ingredients there. Okay. Then they'll issue a report four more times in the day for the following valid periods. That same day, they're going to issue two reports for tomorrow. So do I expect any kind of convective activity? I don't know if it's going to be there. Hey, there's no way in the world. These guys are not mind readers, right? They're not wizards. But there's a reasonable expectation that some thunderstorm activity will exist there. That same day, they're going to issue one report for the day after tomorrow. And I think they actually have that extended out to day four and five now. So they got some pretty good forecasts letting me know that Florida is always going to have thunderstorms every single day of the year. <laughs> Basically, that's all they've done, I think. It's a little better than that. but Okay. Severe weather watch bulletin immediately follows the alert message. So we got an alert message for a severe weather watch bulletin. Message warns of possible tornado activity in Nebraska, defines a watch area. So, tornado, northeast, uh, uh, Nebraska, excuse me, N tornado in Nebraska, uh, 24th day of the month, 1900, and it looks like 25 uh, to the 25th day at, at midnight. Axis 70, statute miles east and west of line 55 south-southwest, uh, Ear Kearney, I don't even know where exactly they've got this. This thing outlines it. Is it posted on the chart anywhere? Where at? Kearney, here. So what I have to do with Kearney is I'd have to come 70 statute miles east and west of the line 55 south-southwest, okay? I have to come around this 55 south-southwest, make a line there. And again, figure out where the hail and surface aloft are. It has two and a half inches, probably, hail or whatever. Wind gust 70 knots, maximum tops 550, mean wind vector 260 at 35. So a weather watch, severe weather in that area. I can promise you that before I was to fly anywhere near this area, I would make sure I got a whole lot better picture of where this thing is located. Okay. And they provide it for me graphically. You'll see this is the text version. I don't feel confident that I know exactly where this thing is just by reading it. Okay. But I would look at the graphic product and find out where it is. Or stay on the ground until the tornado watch goes by. 
If there's a tornado watch in an airport where I am, we're staying on the ground. Sorry. We can tell jokes. We can do whatever you want. But that's what we do over the next couple of minutes, right? Or our next couple hours. Okay. Sigments. Valentil 05 2110. Sigment Papa 1. Arizona, Louisiana, Mississippi, from, Miss, from Memphis to 30 north of MEI, that's an airport identifier, or a VOR, to BTR, looks like uh, Baton Rouge, to MLU to Memphis, occasional severe icing above freezing level expected. What do I have? Severe. So this is a segment. I know that. Over here, Aramet Tango. Before even looking at it, what is Aramet Tango? Moderate turbulence, right? Air met. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's good. So I got valid until air, air met uh, turbulence, Georgia, Florida, from Savannah to Jackson, to Cross City, to Tallahassee to Savannah. Moderate turbulence below 10,000 expected. Conditions improving, okay? And looks like it, conditions improving after midnight Zulu. What do we have here? Probably, let's see if I can tell. Picture from NASA, maybe squall line. I'm not sure exactly what they're trying to tell me here. Killer whale. Okay, convective segment. What's a convective segment? What's that all about? Okay. As soon as I hear convective segment, I'm thinking thunderstorms. It's valid until then. Kansas City, Oklahoma, Texas, vicinity GLD, uh, this one, Goodland, CDS. I don't know where in the world CDS is, probably over here somewhere. And that's a line of thunderstorms developing by 1755 Zulu. We'll move eastward 30 to 35 knots through 1855. Hail to one and a half inches possible. Convective segment, same thing, right? But it's an update. The way they'll do these segments is they issue one, then they issue two, then they issue three. This is the 17th one that's been issued. So I know when I hear the forecasters, and they'll broadcast on HIWAS, they'll broadcast on ATC. If you're monitoring ATC, you're on with ATC, they'll tell you that Convective Sigma 17 Charlie, valid until 1855 for Kansas City, Oklahoma, Texas, is published, and it's a line of thunderstorms developing 1755 Zulu. They'll make that broadcast to all airplanes. That's one that I'll get to whoever's on that frequency. I'll get that. This is significant weather. This is convective Sigma, right? If it gets an update, it started off as 17 Alpha, and then it was 17 Bravo, and then it's 17 Charlie, Every time they issue a new update, I will get that another uh, radio report from ATC, okay? And they'll do it on all ATC frequencies that are in that region. All right, same thing, WST, so convective segment. Why is it WST? I have no idea. 18 Charlie, it's the 18th one that was issued. It's the Charlie update, and it's valid until 1855. Uh, South Dakota, n uh, where is that at? Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa. From FSD to DSM to GRI to BFF to FSD. So I got some airport identifiers to look up. I don't know where those are, but I could look them up. Make a nice straight line between all of them. That's the area, that's the region. Area of thunderstorms with few embedded cells moving from 270 uh, at 25, tops 30, forecast 1855. Dissipating area will move eastward at 25 knots. So, so yes. Uh, what's the, the, the 17 and the 18 uh, mean? It's, it's the number of the report. Okay. So the very first one that they issued on that day was number one. Okay. And then somewhere else they had another one that came up and that one became number two. It's just an idea, it's, it's on a long flight, it's an opportunity for me to continue to monitor this and listen to, okay, what's happening with 17? All right, now we're on 17 Foxtrot. What are they doing with 17 Foxtrot? 
But now they're on 17 golf. Let's listen to this, 17 golf. So it's an opportunity to me to start, oh, what's happened with 18? 18's along our route of flight, but it's before the destination. What's happening there? To, to keep in mind, kind of, now I don't have to continuously draw that same straight line. I can visualize in my mind where it has a name kind of. They've named this thing, okay? Thank you.